morning, fellow mathematicians. Welcome back to the most important lesson on complex numbers, okay? Complex numbers but different is going to kind of end at this point. I'm going to make one or two bonus videos after that, but this right here is the big conclusive video because we are going to talk about what complex numbers actually are. What is the meaning behind complex numbers? Why did we end up with something weird like the rotation matrix after plugging imaginary part and imaginary unit i into the exponential function? And also, why did Papa before talk about this linear mapping right here, this vector space isomorphism? Also, this is a complex number set, once again, written out. <laughs> We are going to talk about the geometric meaning behind complex numbers. And this is the most important thing about complex numbers. They are not simply an extension of the real numbers, for example. They have a nice geometric meaning. And after, you, uh, after we have talked about that, you are hopefully going to understand what complex numbers actually are. Now, I would like to work with our linear transformation that we have right here. T of A, negative B, B and A is going to map to this vector in R2, AB. And now we are going to take a look at the vector AB, okay? Just simply in the plane. Now, this is our vector AB. And I have kind of said it before, okay? In another video where we have talked about the homomorphism and stuff like this, a vector has a certain length R. This length r we can actually find out, okay, because we have some a coordinate and we have some b coordinate that make up our vector. Also, there's a certain angle enclosed between the x-axis and our radius. We are going to call this angle phi, okay, phi right here, phi, okay, maybe it's going to click in your head already. Now we can basically use Papa not Pythagoras, but simply Papa cosine and sine, okay? Now we have that the cosine of phi is nothing other than a over r adjacent over hypotenuse, meaning if we were to solve for our, um, let's say, a, okay? We are going to solve for a, then a is thus r times the cosine of phi. We don't want r to be equal to zero. Now, this is simply the co, not the cosine. We can do the same spiel for our b right here. b is thus r times the sine of phi. Okay, this is weird, okay? Let us plug this into here, into our vector. We are going to end up with a common factor of r. This is simply a scalar and that's a vector space. Okay, our r2 meaning we can bring scalars to the outside. r times this vector cosine of phi times the sine of phi. Now, this thing right here is simply a vector yet again in R2, meaning we can do our transformation backwards and end up with R times T, or since this thing right here is a linear mapping, we can bring this R to the inside of our T. So R times cosine, negative sine, sine and cosine. This is nothing other than our rotation matrix that we have right here. What is our R exactly? If we take a look at Papa Pythagoras this time, R squared is A squared plus B squared. R is a length, it's defined positive. We can take the positive third to end up with the square root of A squared plus B squared. But we have talked about this before. A squared plus, plus B squared is nothing other than the determinant of our complex number Z. Meaning overall, we are going to end up with t of square root of the determinant of z times our rotation matrix. And here's one fact that is going to come in now. If you remember correctly, our t is bijective, meaning it's also injective. Injective tells us that if we have t of a being equal to t of b, a is equal to b. This is what it implies. Meaning overall, we have that the matrix A negative B, B and A is thus equal to the square root of the determinant of Z times our rotation matrix, which is nothing other than E to the I phi. Now, 
each and every complex number that we have can be expressed in the form r times e to the imaginary unit times the angle between our vector and the x-axis, the argument of the complex number. And you can go more formally about the phi. Phi is nothing other than the tangent, the inverse tangent of b over a. So you can just solve this system of equations. Okay, then you have sine over cosine. Okay, if you just um, do some little linear algebra action right here and then take the inverse tangent. This is just what it is. But here's the thing. Each and every complex number is basically just a rotation of a vector in the plane. This is what complex numbers actually are times the magnitude. Okay, we, we have a certain magnitude of the complex number and there's something called the unit circle. Our sine and cosine are defined on the unit circle, meaning if we were to have the unit circle, then this radius would be exactly one. So everything on the unit circle is going to be just of the form e to the i times phi. And this is extremely important. So here's one big lesson you have to learn about complex numbers. Complex numbers are not simply numbers, like an extension of the real number line, okay? Complex numbers are basically a transformation. They are a rotation of a vector in a plane. I'm going to take a look at something else and maybe it does make even more sense to you then. We are going to define ourselves a mapping, small c, and it's going to be a mapping from R2 to R2. And we are going to define a mapping as follows. We are going to take c of some vector x, y, I'm going to call it like this, and the c is just a linear mapping. We are going to use complex number on this, okay? So we are going to have a negative b, b and a times x, y. And I'm going to use a numerical example such that you can see it a bit better. So what does our complex numbers do to a vector x, y. Let us say that our complex number is, um, I don't know, 3, negative 2, 2 and 3. And I'm going to choose a certain vector, namely 1, 0. You remember, we can actually break up complex numbers into real and imaginary part, meaning this is nothing other than 3 times the identity matrix using the distributive laws. We are going to put the 1, 0 here and then plus our imaginary part basically and then 2, times um, the identity matrix times one zero. Let us do some sketches right here. At first we have our vector one zero. It looks like this thing right here. Now we have a new vector. If we were to multiply the identity matrix by this vector it's going to be one and then zero. So this thing is going to result in one zero times three. Meaning I'm going to get myself some color chalk right here. Now, we are going to have 3, this is going to be here, and 0. This is the first vector that we have right here. Meaning, what we did to our vector after multiplying it with the real part is we are basically stretching our vector A units. Now, what is going to happen to our next one? 2 times the identity times one zero. Well, identity times one zero is going to result in one zero. Now we are going to have two times one zero. Meaning overall, it's going to be, they lie on the same axis, this vector. Meaning yet again, we did a stretch of our original vector that we have plugged into here. But now we are going to multiply this new vector by i. Meaning if we were to have i times one zero, this is nothing other than 0, negative 1, 1 and 0, times 1, 0. Meaning overall this is going to end up with, okay, 0 and then 1. 0 and then 1, exactly. If we were to have this, 0 and 1, what is this going to be? Well, our x coordinate is 0 and then we are going to end up with 1 being right here. And also we have a scaling by a factor of 2. Meaning what we did with this vector right here, okay, with 2, 0, we did an upwards rotation. Pi over 2 in the counterclockwise in the positive direction. And this does make perfect sense because if you plug 
pi over 2 into our sine, it's going to result in exactly our imaginary unit. So our imaginary unit, the thing which lies on our imaginary axis, okay, this thing is going to make up our imaginary axis, is going to be just a pi over 2 rotation in the counterclockwise direction. And now we can just use simple addition of vectors to end up with a resulting vector. You can actually just compute this because this is going to end up with 3, 0, okay, I'm using blue chart now, and then plus, okay, we are going to have um, 0, 2. Is this going to end up with our complex number? So this right here is our complex number 3, 2. This is why I choose 1, 0 right here. So what we are doing is when we apply a vector to a complex number or complex numbers in general, we are doing a scaling of vector, then another scaling of a vector. We are going to rotate this other scaled vector by pi over two units in a counterclockwise direction. And then our resulting vector is going to be a complex number. It's just a vector in the complex plane. And these are complex numbers. Geometric interpretation. They are nice and easy to interpret, basically, in their most basic form. But it's really quite interesting, okay? All those results that we have gathered do make perfect sense, okay? They, they kind of have a connection to our trigonometric function. And if we were to just simply compute a vector with our complex number, we are also going to end up with the same result. It's going to result in a rotation in the complex plane. I thank guys for watching. If you did enjoy this video, please like and subscribe and recommend channel if like. If you want to support channel a bit more, buy those t-shirts I create or support channel on Patreon. I hope you did enjoy the series on complex numbers. It really was a pleasure for me to film everything. And up until the next video, have a flamber day. And do not forget, there are bonus videos to come. <laughs> Ciao! <laughs>